Now, oh, sorry. What is it, Rebecca? Sultanate of Delhi. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the first person to unify India post Gupta. He's pretty boss. He it only it only exists for his life. Eventually, it crashes. No, he's dead. He's dead. Who is it? Well. Harsha. Harsha. Hello. Just, just Harsha? Harsha. King Harsha. Harsha's kingdom. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name? On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the gentleman who starts a whole new uh, belief that Allah, Shiva, and Vishnu are the same person? Can't be Muhammad. He's dead. Who is it? Catherine? Guru Kabir. Guru Kabir. On your whiteboard, please tell me who starts Neo Hinduism or New Hinduism. That is the modern one we currently have today. I've got two. Oh my God. Gary, you should probably look at your notes instead of Rebecca's board. What is it, Rebecca, since Garrett's already looking at it? Sounds good to me. You have these in your notes, darling. You could just look at yours. It's easier hers. I agree. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the only African kingdom that are Christians? Eventually, other, uh, other kingdoms will become Christian, but that's by force. What is it, Lily? Kingdom of Aksum, on your whiteboard, please tell me, what are the two new ships that are being used in the Indian Ocean Basin? This is going to increase the movement of goods. Kiara, what are they? Jukes, sounds good. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what becomes the center of Indian society? They represent two religions. They become cultural, education, and banking centers. Nope, that's Islam. I got one. Yes. Yes, your girl doesn't even have it on her board. Look at you, Garrett. I knew you had it in you. What is it, Garrett? Temple. Temple. See, Rebecca, you should have cheated back, man. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... Uh, please tell me what direction are monsoon winds blowing from summer to spring, uh, spring to summer? I told you, monsoon winds keep coming back. You just need to know it. Benji, what are they? Southwest. Southwest. What are they from fall to winter? What are they? Camden. Northeast. 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 Jackson, it's a board thing, oh, man. <laughs> On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the only kingdom that tolerated the Sultanate of Delhi? Then they got burned and they were like, hell no, never again. Who are they? Sophia? Kingdom of Sounds good. Kingdom of V sounds good to me. We'll just ignore Ren over there huffing and puffing. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of. Ah, that's good enough. All right, let's go. Oh, um, Guru Kabir is going to start what movement? Guru Kabir is going to start what movement, ladies and gentlemen? Good. Try. Uh, Sounds good. All right, let's go. So yesterday we got to um, Byzantine government structures, right? Justin, yes, good. We got to move. So if you don't get my board, caught, like take a picture of my board, before you leave, I'm hopefully going to walk you through it, but you need what's on the, you don't need the uh, stuff on the other side. You don't need classical conditioning, but you do need everything else that I wrote down. I'm going to hopefully walk, hold your hand through it, but if not, I would take a picture of it before we go, because not having 10 minutes today is killing me. So, Justinian is your major emperor of the Byzantine Empire, okay? He is your major one. He is the peak. Okay, his wife's Theodora. We got to her, right? Yes. Okay, so he starts Justinian Code, which is taking 1,000 years of Roman Code, 12 tables, simplifying it to about 514 laws. Good? Perfect. All right, so Byzantine Conquest, they conquer a lot of former Roman territory. 
Okay, if you look at the map, everything in green is the Byzantine Empire. That's pretty impressive, would you agree? Everything in green is the Byzantines. Okay, they're a very successful military. One of the reasons is, is because the fastest way to improve your station in the Byzantine Empire is to go through the military. And that is a very big component of it. So, theme system, put a star next to it in your notes, it's a big deal. The theme system, and I would write, is a land management system. So write theme system and write land management system. It is not the government structure of the Byzantine Empire. What is the government structure of the Byzantine Empire? Abby? Sounds good to me. Okay. So the theme system, all of the land of the Byzantines is broken up and controlled by the generals. The generals are controlled by the emperor. It's a land management system. Okay. So, soldiers from the peasant class are given land um, within this whole theme system. They are following Julius Caesar's lead. Remember when Caesar came into power, he gave a lot more land to the soldiers, gave them higher pay and all that stuff, and made them incredibly loyal. This is why the Byzantine Empire builds as fast as it does and conquers as much territory. It's the theme system, and the generals are the ones in charge that makes it unique. It's not really about political power, it's mostly about management, okay? So that's why it's called land management. All right, let's go to Western Europe, shall we? So on your notes, write Western Europe. Okay, don't write anything down except for Western Europe. I'm just going to tell you a couple things just to remind you of a couple things, yes? I will tell you what you need when we get there, is that fair? So, of course, uh, who can raise your hand and tell me what year does Rome fall? What do we got? Uh, Kira? 410. 410. It's the first time the Germanic Empire comes in. 432, we have our first Germanic Empire on the throne. Now, we call the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Lombards, and the Franks what during the Roman Empire? Kira? Barbarians. Are they called barbarians anymore now that the Roman Empire's fall, Kira? No, they're not. Why aren't they called barbarians anymore? Why were they called barbarians in the first place, Camden? Because they were all like uh, under like one group, like now. coming into Rome. No, that's why they have like five different names. How can they be the same? They have all different names. Why, uh, Henry? Because they're not Roman. They're not Roman, so they're called barbarians. The term barbarians is a very pro-Roman, anti everyone else. Okay, so when you use it, okay, it's very diminishing to everyone else. Well, Roman Empire is fallen, correct? So you can't be barbarians anymore. Because there's no Romans. So, and keep that in mind. Do not use that terminology post-Rome. So, the Germanic empires are going to come in and they are going to start their own thing. The most powerful one is the Franks. You're going to write the Franks. Okay? So the Franks are going to have the biggest influence. What you need to write down is they convert to Christianity immediately. So Roman Empire is dead, ladies and gentlemen, 410. Oh, I'm so sorry. The Franks are going to convert to Christianity immediately. They are going to make an alliance with the Pope. They're immediately going to reach out to the Pope and say, Hey, Pope, I see you in Rome. Okay? Yeah, I know you need a buddy right now. If you need a buddy, I got your back. Just let us know. And the Pope's like, Oh, man, thank you so much. I appreciate it because I need someone to fight for me. And the Franks are like, We got you. And that's the beginning of it. And they're talking to the Pope and the Pope. No, they're talking to the Pope. Pope. The church hasn't split yet. Poppy? So we're essentially Rome's just fallen in 410. Yeah. So oh. everything's in chaos right now, and the Franks are the first one to rise. <coughs> so we're keeping it simple, stupid. We're gonna get to the issues here in a second. Does that make sense? The Byzantine we started with first because they're the most influential. Which are like six Yeah, they're gonna come up a little bit. So this is, uh, right now we're in about 580s here in uh, Western Europe. Oh, this is before the Byzantines? This is right around the start of the Byzantines. Byzantine Empire itself at its peak is going to be 600 something. This is about between uh, the fall of Rome and the Byzantines. They're coming up at the same time, guys. Is that fair? Just keep it like that. All right, so the Carolinians you do need to write down. Carolinians are the Franks. The Franks are the Carolinians. The Carolinians happens to be the first empire. It is started by a guy named Charles 
The hammer Martel. If I was gonna be like a boxer, it would be the hammer. I know no one would ever fight me because like I'm really not that intimidating. Just say they're the same thing. They are. The Carolinian Empire is the first Frankish Empire. Okay, so Charles the Hammer Martel begins Carolinian Dynasty. Okay, he defeats the Moors. He kicks the Moors out of France and pushes them back into Spain. That's a very important component because it stops the Islamic push into Europe. Because he stops the Islamic push into Europe, Western Europe becomes what major religion? Christianity. If Charles Martel did not stop them, who knows what the world would look like today? True or true? It'd be insane. It'd be totally different. So Charles Martel is really going to have an incredibly influential look just on religion. So he stops the uh, Muslims from pushing in, and it's called the Battle of Tours, uh, and that's a big deal. His grandson is a very big deal. His grandson is Charlemagne. He's all Carolinian. So Charles Martel defeats the Moors, okay, and he starts the Carolinian Empire. It's Charlemagne who makes the Carolinian Empire a big deal. Uh, he centralizes imperial rule. He is the first one to centralize European rule post-Romans. And no one's going to do it for a long time after. So Charlemagne is the first one to unify and centralize rule. After he dies, it goes back into chaos. Okay? So, he's functionally illiterate. But he loves education. <coughs> what is this time period called in Europe? What do we call this time period? Post-Roman Empire? Who can raise your hand and tell me what we call this time period? Lily? No. No. <laughs> what do we call it? And Dark Ages. Dark Ages. Middle Ages. Medieval times. Why do we call it the Dark Ages? Who can raise your hand and tell me why we call it the Dark Ages? Why? It's not like the climate changes, people. Why? Tanner? Is it disease? Ah, well, we always have disease, and they're playing with sticks in the Dark Ages, so it's worse. What do you got, Camden? Is it chaos? Nah, uh, it's kind of chaos. We've got the Vikings going around doing Viking things. The reason is, is because there's not that much education and culture. What, uh, Asia and the Middle East are booming in culture right now and arts and all that stuff, and Europe is literally playing with sticks. Literally struggling to feed themselves and bathe. Terrible hygiene. Okay? <laughs> so... This guy believes in education, and that's a very big deal, and it's very strange. Please know that. He also starts this thing called the Missy Dominacci. You need to write it down, put a star next to it. I'm really sure it's on your desk. The Missy Dominacci, created by Charlemagne, wander around his kingdom and make sure the government isn't abusing their power. What a great guy, right? For normal people like you and I, isn't that wonderful? No? Yes. We, like, we like government abuse? Cool. Me too. I don't like government abuse. Anymore. I was just kidding. People don't care. All right, so he creates the Missy Dominacci. They travel around. Every year they go to every single part of the kingdom and make sure government abuse. This will lay the foundation for auditing. My husband's an auditor. The Missy Dominacci start auditing practices. I told my husband that a couple years ago, and he was like, who cares? Well, in case you do care, that's it. All right, so Charlemagne becomes emperor. He gets the title. Stop, don't write that. Write down. Charlemagne is the first Roman empire, emperor post-Rome. <laughs> exactly. Why? Okay. I think we can all agree he's the first Roman Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor post Rome. He's in the title Holy Roman Emperor. And stop and listen for two seconds. Rome has fallen. Rome's dead. Okay? Christian church is kind of in a hot mess. It's in Rome. Rome gets sacked like 13 times. Okay, so the Pope is like living a stressful life, right? I mean, pretty good life, don't get me wrong, but like still pretty stressful. So he's looking out for help, correct? What would make the most logical sense for the Pope to reach out to? The Carolinian or the Byzantines? Who logically, who makes more money? Byzantines. Who has a larger empire? Byzantines. Who has a larger military? Byzantines. So the Pope says, screw you, Byzantines, and picks a guy called Charlemagne playing with sticks in Western Europe. 
and says, ta-da, you're my Holy Roman Emperor. Do it, do it. And, em and Charlemagne's like, what the hell? Why is this happening? Like, this is crazy. Charlemagne, of course, takes the honor and sits on his little throne, calls himself the Holy Roman Emperor and all that crap because it's a cool title. True, not true. You could call me a Holy Roman Emperor if you'd like, if you're pretty boss. He takes the honor. If you are the emperor in Byzantine, in Byzantium, how would you feel about this? Sad. Sad? Rage. White hot rage, which will lead to the breaking of Christianity. So, this is the first step. Charlemagne becomes a Holy Roman Emperor. This is off Byzantium. Okay? Pope Leo III. No one really knows why. Maybe just a big screw you to the Byzantines because they weren't exactly following orders like they were supposed to because they have some issues which we're going to really start talking about here in a second. So it's not a super, super, it was kind of more of a screw you. What? No, it's a complete lie. It's a complete lie. Rome's dead. It dies in 410. Okay? But this is 800, and he declares someone a Holy Roman Emperor. It's a lie. Yes? We need no pope. No, you don't need. I'll tell you when you need a name. All right, so the Carolinian Empire is eventually going to extend into Rome. Why? Because he's a Holy Roman Empire Emperor. Okay? So they're going to conquer all this territory. It's a pretty big state, obviously. Now, Louis the Pious... Okay? He is going to be the son of Charlemagne, and he's a terrible, terrible ruler, and the empire dies with him. Yes. You just need to know empire dies with Louis the Pious. Okay? Now, after Charlemagne dies, he divides it amongst his three children. Louis the Pious kills the other two, and then becomes religious. That's why it's called Louis the Pious. And uh, anyway, it falls apart. All right, to the boards. Here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the first centralized Western European kingdom? What is the name of the first centralized Western European kingdom? No. Those are the people who are in it. No. I got one. I got two, three, four. It was a Matthew. Carolinians. Carolinians were founded by who? The Carolinians are founded by who? Yes! Who is it, Timmy? The but, oh, no, lies. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> sorry, Timmy. I didn't mean to call you lies. I meant to say, oops, no. Who is it? Uh, Ali. Charles Martel. They're all called the Franks. The hammer. Can't yeah, forget the hammer. Yeah, the hammer, man. Okay, so Charles Martel gets famous for defeating who? Good. You can't, it's a religion, man. You can't, like, defeat well, a religion. Stop the pushers. Well, who is it, Kira? Spanish Muslims. Spanish Muslims called the Moors. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name of the gentleman who believes in education and is a flicker of light in the dark ages? Who is it, Julia? Charlemagne. Charlemagne. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Charlemagne creates what government officials to go through and regulate? Make sure that the government does not abuse its power, which is pretty great for people like us. What is it? Garrett. Missy Dominacci. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the land-holding system of the Byzantine Empire? What is the land-holding system of the Byzantine Empire? Georgia, don't you dare start that crap. <coughs> What is it? Benji. Theme system. Who's in charge of each of the themes? Who is in charge? Natalie. Generals. On your whiteboard, what is the law code of the Byzantines? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's go, let's go. No. What's it called? Timmy. Justinian code is based on what previous law code? Don't tell me who made it. Tell me what it's called. Good. What is it? Rebecca. There you go. All right. On your whiteboard, please. Nope. Let's go. All right. So 
You need to know that Europe, Western Europe is having tons of invasions. I don't care about the Muslims. I don't care about the Magars. Who cares about them? You need to know the Vikings. You need to know the Vikings. The Vikings are awesome. They are the coolest people in Western Europe. They're terrible people, and I think that's what I like about them. Okay? I love them. So, first and foremost, the Vikings are going in and they're raiding. There's two major reasons why they're raiding. You need to know that their population is, exceeds their farming capabilities. So the first reason why uh, Vikings are raiding your other European villages is they need food. Their population exceeds. Exceeds like their uh, ability to feed. So they can't farm that much land in Norway. So they have to go find other places. So they need food, so they start raiding. The second reason is they find out they're really good at raiding. So they're like, screw it, let's steal good stuff. That's it. They're, super, they're awesome. So the coolest thing, the reason why they raid so well, and you're going to want to write this down, they use small boats and rivers. So the Vikings get in a river on their boat, sail down the river until where they're getting off. They get off of the boat. They flip the boat upside down on their shoulders, and then they run. <laughs> they run to the village they're raiding. They drop the boat, flip it back so the keel's on the bottom. They go into the village. They steal whatever they want. They put it in the boat. Then they carry the boat like this to the river, and then they leave. That's quite the system. That's really cool. That is really effective. And they are really good at it, and they become incredibly wealthy. And they kill tons of people. And it is cool. So, the Vikings, the reason why they originally start is food, correct? Then they find out they're really good at it. And they have the perfect scheme, which makes a lot of sense, correct? They literally run through the woods with boats on their shoulders, fill the boats, get on a river, and leave. Genius. Genius. So, it's important that you know that they attack everywhere in Western Europe. They are attacking everywhere in yes, Western Europe. Would this be absolutely terrifying to live through? Absolutely. So because of that, and put a very big star next to this, because of the Vikings, the Carolinian Empire collapses. Obviously you also have Louis the, Pi Pi Louis the Pious being awful. The Vikings decentralized governments become n the norm. No centralized government is going to rise out of the Carolinian until we get to period four. We're in three. So it's going to be a long time. I know, man. It's crazy. It's all because of the Vikings. It's so cool. Decentralized government called feudalism. Guys, if we have a zombie apocalypse tonight, the government's going to fall to feudalism. It's incredibly effective. Feudalism. It's decentralized, caused by the Vikings post Carolina, which we're going to get to here in a second. Okay. Western Byzantium, you got trade. I'm going to fly through some stuff because you don't care about some. Can we agree? If it's not on the test, you don't care. Can we agree? Yes. All right, so here we go. Western Europe is going to be farming based post Carolinian, right? Farming based post Carolinian, decentralized government. So, you're going to write feudalism. Decentralized, caused by Vikings, post Carolinian. Okay? At the very top of the feudalistic pyramid, you have the king, which is a regional king. Just like in India, okay, when you have a major empire that rises, when it collapses, it falls into. It falls into small kingdoms. Same type of thing. It's kind of like a feudalistic, except kind of, yeah, actually, it's a pretty good uh, connection. I'll take it. Let me use that. Okay? So the kings are very small, but not very big. So you have the king, which is a regional kingdom. Then you have the lords who live with the king. Okay? And they kind of do the king's bidding. Then you have nobles. Okay? These nobles manage the land. So they do not live with the king. They live out in the land, and they manage the land. They live in manor houses, and this becomes the center of Western Europe's economy. So, if nobles live in manor houses, and it becomes the center of Western Europe's economy, is trade a big thing? No, people, no. 
Trade is not a big thing. People are simply just moving around food. Knights are your second. They protect the nobles, the land, and the people. Uh, then the people farming. I wrote it really quick last period. It's fine. Okay, so knights protect the nobles, the land, and the people farming. They get land in exchange. Ignore important Christians for right now. We'll come to that later. Okay, so knights protect nobles, land, and people farming in exchange for land. Then you have peasants. Peasants are free people. So if I have my own village, the village of Bennett, and Benji is a free sir, a free peasant, if he doesn't like my village, he can go to Ren's village. Okay? If he doesn't like Ren's village, then he can go to someone else's village. That's what a peasant can do. They can choose their place they live. At the very bottom, you have serfs. S-E-R-F-S. -S. They are not slaves. They are tied to the land. So say, for instance, this is my feudal kingdom. I am the noble, you are my serfs, okay? So say, for instance, if you are my serfs and I die, okay, the next noble who comes up, they, they're managing the land. If you are a serf, you're tied to the land. So I can't sell this row to rent. I can't sell you, I can't move you. Okay? It's not, you don't belong to me. I can't tell Henry to marry someone and make lots of babies. That's not my business. Okay? And if he was my slave, I could. I could force him to have babies. I could force him to mate who with whoever I want because he's my property. With a serf, they're not slaves. They're people. They sign a feudal contract. They sign a contract for protection in exchange for working the land or farming. Your serfs are farming. Your peasants are farming and doing merchants, like they're doing your iron work and stuff like that. Your knights are protecting, your nobles are managing, your lords are taking direction, and your king's doing king things. Okay? You need to know feudalism is based on rights and obligations. As a serf, you have the right to what? Protection, but you have the obligation of? working the land. Everyone has a right. Nobles have the right to live in the manor house, but have the obligation of managing all of the food production. Does that make sense? The king has the right to rule, but has the obligation of protecting everyone. And who are they protecting from? Vikings! Vikings! Vikings. Yes! Don't you love the Vikings? They are awesome. And What's up there? A baron, okay, so as, a great question. Have you heard of the counts and barons and all that crap? Okay, as society gets more complicated, as Western Europe starts trading more, and there's more opportunities for money, we start having more complications. So in a simplistic form, and that's feudalism. So if we go into a zombie apocalypse tonight, and within like 10 years we'll have a feudalistic society here in the United States, yes, because that zombie apocalypse, that's the basic format that's going to happen. In 400 years after the zombie apocalypse, we're probably going to have more tiers, just like the Jati and the caste system. As society gets more complicated, we have more layers, which is why we have counts and barons and all that stuff. All right. There we go. Byzantium. It's fine. Western Europe. We got our feudalism, which is what we have over here. Um, and it's all about trying to protect people from farming. People are scared. When people are scared, people are going to do whatever it takes. There we go. Lords, I just simplified it for you. Rights and obligations. Killing it right now. Crushing it. Okay, so when we're talking about feudalism, you need to know that it is Christian-based. Everything, everyone goes to the same church. Like, Lord and the no if the noble is home, they go to the same church as the serf. Now, do you think they have the same seats? No. No, the gross people are in the back. The cleaner people are in the front. And they have little boxes around them. Have you ever been to, like, an old school church? They have, like, boxes, and you're not allowed to, like, go into the boxes. Like, it's all, like, heredity. Anyway, it's all Christian-based, and the code of ethics is chivalry. Is chivalry a good thing or a bad thing for women? 
bad. It is bad for women. Prior to chivalry and feudalism, women were seen as kind of valuable. I mean, we're still women, so we're not really valuable. However, with chivalry, women are now oh, dainty little flowers that can faint at any time. We need a man to protect us and open all of our doors. <laughs> chivalry. So women are to be won in battle. They are treasures to be kept and protected. Women lose social status with it. Anyway, what? Does that break your little heart? No, I just thought it was like a good thing because like, like guys like Old people say, yeah. old. And they're like, chivalry is dead. <laughs> like, wait, wait, what did they say? They say chivalry is dead. No, I like the tone. I wanted the tone again. Chivalry is dead. <laughs> I like the tone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like the whole opening doors. Like, you shouldn't open a door just because it's a woman. You should open the door because it's the right thing to do. Ladies, you should open a door for a man because it's the right <laughs> thing to do. What are you gonna do? Close the door behind you? <laughs> oh my God, Make sweetie, sure, like, sweetie, too. we want equality. We don't need to be put on a pedestal because you can only fall from a pedestal. <laughs> I don't want to be put on a glass shelf, my darling. I want to be able to do what I want to do. <laughs> All right. So Christian societies. What do you got? Is that just? Oh, it's only Western, yeah. We're still in Western here. Okay, so Christian societies. All right. <clears throat> I want you to write the title, Christianity Splits. This is a very big concept, and it's going to keep coming out, please. So please listen very carefully. I'm going to do it as basic and bare bones as possible. Okay. So Christianity is split between two regions of Europe, correct? Eastern and Western. I think we can all agree at this point, Eastern and Western Europe look very different, correct? Western is playing with sticks, farming. Okay, we're getting raided by Vikings, so things aren't good. Eastern Europe is booming and has metropolises, correct? Rome is the center of Western Europe. Eastern Europe is going to be centered by Constantinople, which is the center of the Byzantines. Okay, so I think we can agree there's a very big, uh, very big gap between Rome and what we would call Constantinople, yes? Okay, so lack of communication is a big problem, okay? The Romans and the Eastern Empire start kind of creating stuff differently. It's just like if you move away from your best friend, you and your best friend start changing and being different people, correct? Hello? Yes. Okay, think about it in a major way with a religion. The further you are away from each other, the harder it is to keep it nice and copacetic, correct? So what happens is Christianity is going to go through some growing pains. Western Europe is going to say super hardcore to this whole like traditional idea, okay? Eastern Europe loves icons. And when you need to write down icons equals saints and other religious figures. Icons, when we talk about icons, we're talking about like Mother Mary, we're talking about Joseph, we're talking about all of your saints. In Eastern Europe, if you had a problem, like with your children, like your parent, like your parents just hate you as children, what they would do is they would pray to Mother Mary for patience. Okay, in Eastern Europe, praying to Mother Mary is like praying kind of like to Jesus. Okay, essentially you have Jesus on top, you have the saints directly below, and all that stuff, and all of your icons are directly below Jesus. Western Europe. Jesus is up top with the Holy, the Holy Trinity, God, the Holy Ghost, and Jesus, right? Isn't that the Holy Trinity? Nice. Okay? You have those up there, and then there's a long gap between the saints. And if you're a Roman Catholic, okay? If you're a Roman Catholic, if you pray to a saint, you're calling up, like, Mother Mary and saying, Hey, Mother Mary, I really need to talk, uh, talk to Jesus. You know, I'm having problems with my kids. Send Jesus when he has a moment. Then Mother Mary turns and talks to Jesus, being like, hey, Sam Bennett's got a problem with children. Can you talk to her? In Eastern Orthodox, you pray directly to Mother Mary, and Mother Mary answers your prayers. Okay? So essentially, Western Europe called iconology false idols. 
because you would pray straight to Mother Mary in Eastern Europe. And in Western Europe, Mother Mary is just relaying the phone calls. Does that make sense? Hello? You pray to Mother Mary to get in touch with Jesus. Okay? In Eastern Europe, you pray directly to Mother Mary, and Mother Mary solves your problem. They consider it false idols. So what that whole thing comes about is you have Christianity. At this point, everyone is a Christian. Everyone's under the same church. Then you have the iconoclasm, which is a fight over icons. It is a fight within the church whether you can pray to saints and whether those saints can respond to you or do they send the message along. It's an internal conflict, and it's a very big deal. Tanya, you better write this down, man. This is a huge deal. So, iconoclasm is a conflict over use of the icons. Are saints able to be prayed to? Can saints answer it? Or is it wrong? Is it false idols? Okay? Should you pray to them or should you not? Western Europe says you can pray to them only to talk to Jesus. Eastern was like, yeah, they can totally answer your prayers. They can do all that stuff. So theology is different. What we're going to see, the Romans go to Constantinople and burn down a bunch of their icons. All their religious icons, they burn them down. Is that going to cause a problem between the church? Yes. So then it's going to cause the great schism, which is the breaking of the church. At this point, you then have Eastern Orthodox and Roman. So Christianity officially breaks into two sects. Eastern and Western, both of the popes excommunicate each other. Excommunicate means you're removed from the church and you're sent to hell. Yes. So the Eastern Orthodox is the one that is icons. Yes. The iconic, they, have, they worship icons. You can pray to Mother Mary and Mother Mary answers your call, solves all their problems and all that stuff. Uh, if you're a Roman Empire, you pray to Mother Mary so you can talk to Jesus. Hi. Uh, we're literally doing the same stuff right oh now. Oh my god, this is so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Oh, you did the iconoclasm and everything? Yeah. Oh. Says that they have a quiz today, yeah, Cesaro yeah. Papism and Byzantine Empire is all on it. So yeah! They're perfectly aligned. Oh my god, this is so exciting. You should come next year and see my class. Yes! I can actually. Can't I? Yes, I can. It's really good at uh, perfectly aligned because I'm going to have to watch those crash course videos. <laughs> Do you watch the ones I uh, pin? Yeah. 